Now, um, your volume is good. Okay. Um, I'm gonna turn this one over here just a little bit so I can catch you a little more about Vic. Okay. Cool. And, um, you wanna do your thing? Okay, cool, awesome. Hi, hi Rosh. Hi. Thanks for coming here today. Sure. Um, and could you introduce yourself? Um, I am Ralph Wilcox. I am the National Register and Survey Coordinator for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, um, a position I've held since April of 2002. Oh, wow. Well, thanks for being here. Um, and so um, we're asked here today to talk about the National um, Register listing for the Historic Arkansas Museum, which you wrote. Um, mm -hmm. And um, when did the um, museum get put on the register? The National Register nomination uh, was approved by the Park Service on May 31st of 2019. Um, the process for it, though, started, oh gosh, probably in early to mid-2018. Um, okay. It took some time to put all the research together and, and write out the application. Mm -hmm. So from start to finish, the whole process was probably about a year, two year and a half. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and so um, most people probably think when they see our buildings, uh, when they come to the museum, that these um, structures were placed on the National Register because they're 18 buildings from the 1800s. Um, but what's the real reason? <laughs> Um, yes, they are buildings from the 1800s, but, but the reason that they were put on the National Register um, was actually twofold. Um, <clears throat> the biggest part of it is the fact that when uh, Arkansas Territorial Restoration, as it was called at the time, um, when the buildings were restored in the, in the late 1930s, it was one of the early preservation projects uh, in the state of Arkansas, and it was actually the first historic preservation project that involved more than one building. Uh, the projects done before this were all single buildings around the state. So they were listed because of their importance in reflecting what the early historic preservation movement was in the state. Um, they were also listed um, architecturally because um, architect Max Mayer, who was a prominent and significant early 20th century architect here in the Little Rock area, was involved in drawing up the plans and designing what the building were going to look like um, once the restoration was finished. So it was listed not only for its historical association, but also for its 20th century mm -hmm. architectural significance. Yeah. Um, so um, what, um, what other preservation efforts have been undertaken prior to this? So the earliest ones. Sure. Prior to Arkansas Territorial Restoration, there were two other historic preservation projects um, that were undertaken around the state. The first one was the preservation of the old state house, um, which um, was something that they were looking at um, as the legislature was moving out and as the new Capitol building was being finished. So there was there was some effort um, in the early 20th century to, to figure out how to preserve that building and how to make that building a viable part of the city. Um, the other uh, historic preservation project that was being undertaken um, in the 20s was the preservation of the 1836 uh, Hempstead County Courthouse um, down at Washington, which um, during the Civil War served as the state's Confederate capital. So prior to Arkansas territorial restorations, uh, those two historic preservation projects were kind of the, the, the start of the preservation movement in the state. But, you know, those involved just single buildings. Yeah. And so we know that um, Louise Lepro um, and Max Mayer, they both were, drew a lot of inspiration from Colonial Williamsburg, which had just kind of really started um, preserving its structures in the 20s and 30s. Um, but how do you, how can we see that on the grounds of how she um, kind of drew inspiration from Colonial Williamsburg? Well, when you look at Colonial Williamsburg, which was being done at that time, the 20s and the 30s, um, Colonial Williamsburg was kind of looked at, when you look at the plan of the city, at least as it is today, it's a very formal plan. Um, you know, the, the, the main buildings are, you know, at the ends of this long, wide, kind of, you know, boulevard in the center of the community, and it's very well kept and very nice and very neat, um, which you can see here at Ham as well. Um, Historic Arkansas Museum is, is um, you know, kind of formally laid out. It's very clean and very well kept. Um, but in the 19th century or the 18th century in Williamsburg, that is not the case. It would not have been this nice, pristine yes. um, neighborhood or this nice, pristine environment that we have today. So the, the appearance here 
um, did draw inspiration from that. And also the fact that um, when, when Historic Arkansas Museum was done, yes, they looked at materials and they did research and they did that kind of thing, but they also came into it kind of with a vision of what they felt the mm -hmm. neighborhood should look like, yeah. um, which wasn't always 100% accurate. <laughs> Yeah, no, we know that um, Louise Lockrow didn't get it right all the time and she definitely had some ideas of what she felt it should look like. Um, we were actually in one of the buildings um, that she felt incorrectly about. Um, gotcha. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, we're in the Woodruff Print Shop, um, which was actually reconstructed in 2010 um, after some archaeological investigation. Um, the original Woodruff Print Shop was demolished as part of the restoration um, in the 1930s. Um, and the reason was uh, the Woodruff Print Shop, when it was built, was a two story brick building. Um, the Arkansas Gazette from the period when they moved into this building said very specifically it was a two story brick building. And I think at the time it was one of only six brick mm -hmm. buildings in the, in the city. Um, when Louise Loughborough and, and the committee was looking at restoring um, Arkansas territorial restoration, they didn't feel that a brick building met their vision of what a territorial city hmm. would have looked like in the early 19th century. To them, a two-story brick building was much more East Coast, mm -hmm. it was much more high class than what you would have found in Little Rock at the time. Um, obviously, that vision wasn't 100% right, and so as a result, they did tear down um, the original print shop in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the one that is here today is, is reconstructed based on historical information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we know that um, she even, like, kind of like what we were going back to with the formal grounds, um, she rearranged some of the houses too for the, from their original structures. That, that's right, the Mayfaker yeah. House, for example, um, which is now uh, to the west of the print shop, um, originally was on the opposite corner of the block, mm -hmm. um, just in between the Brownlee House and the Hinder Light of Rock Shop, mm -hmm. um, but it was moved. Um, as part of the restoration, and, and in, in doing research, I never did exactly figure out why, um, other yeah. than um, I guess they felt it needed to be over there. So the McVicker house actually was moved as part of the restoration. Yeah. Now I know that she um, established kind of a rose garden where the Bramley um, area was and kind of this pavilion, and so I wonder if that was the reason to Maybe. Yeah, I, the I, I've seen, you know, old postcards and old yeah. photographs of the complex, and yeah, there was very much a formal garden yeah. in the middle of it, which in, in 19th century Little Rock, especially in this neighborhood, would not have existed. Mm -hmm. So again, that just shows that, you know, the committee and, and Ms. Loughborough had this vision that they wanted to carry out, which, although nice and very attractive, yes. um, was not what we would have found in the 19th century. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, part of the other preservation efforts that we have on the grounds um, were removing the pump bayou structures um, from Scott. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? And then uh, the Plum Bayou Block Cabin uh, was moved here in the early or mid 1970s mm -hmm. um, from Scott out in the country. Um, it was moved here to preserve it because um, if it had remained out in Scott, more than likely it would have disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, from a preservation standpoint, um, we often deal with trade offs and we often deal with kind of conflicting viewpoints. Um, Obviously, moving the cabins from Scott out mm -hmm. in a very rural area to the middle of downtown Little Rock um, changes its setting pretty dramatically. But the upside was the fact that it was moved here it means that, that it, it has been preserved mm -hmm. and is here for visitors to enjoy. Yeah. Um, one of the preservation efforts I think that people um, can see very evidently with um, through postcards and old photographs is looking at the Hinderletter Grog Shop, which is one of our most significant structures in the oldest building. Um, but when you look at the images of it from right before Louise Lepro came on board, there are tons of windows and tons of doors, and it was definitely you know had many different lives as a restaurant and tenant buildings. Um, but how did they know where the original windows were, and was that effort? Um, um, my guess is, um, and, and they talk about this with several of the buildings mm -hmm. here at the complex, as as they got into the restoration and they removed additions to mm -hmm. buildings that had been added throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, 
they, their, their plan for preservation of the complex kind of changed almost on a daily basis because as you peeled back those layers of additions and those layers of paint and whatever, you would find where windows were or where doors were. And so, yeah, the, the grog shop does look quite different from the early photos. Um, there were a lot more windows and a lot more doors. Um, the fact that that building is, is a, a log structure underneath the siding, um, it would have been very easy to see where openings would have been. And so as they peeled back, you know, the siding and the layers of advertisements that were on the building too, um, they, were, they would have been able to figure out, okay, here's a big gap in this log. <laughs> Obviously there was a door or window in this yes. location. And so that's, that's how they approached um, the restoration on, on all of the buildings. And like I said, based on all of that, you know, what they started with as their vision and what they ended up with ended up being very different, mm -hmm. just because of things that they discovered um, going through the process. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, do you know what the next significant uh, state funded preservation effort um, was in Arkansas? Quite honestly, I don't. Uh, <laughs> after, after HAM was done, HAM opened in 1941 um, to the public. Um, my guess is uh, some of the work at Washington mm -hmm. was obviously a pretty significant preservation project that, that took off, I'm sure, at least by the 1960s, if not earlier. Um, of course, today when we think of our, our state parks and other state historic sites, you know, a lot of them have CCC constructed buildings, you know, state park cabins and things like that, but you have to remember that when Historic Arkansas Museum was done in the early 1940s, those buildings were contemporary, they were less than 10 years old. So a lot of the things that we think of as historic today when this was done were just an everyday building. Yeah. Um, so my guess is Historic Washington was probably um, one, of the, one of the big mid-century mid um, preservation projects. I, Fort Smith National Historic Site is probably another one. Yeah. Um, I know that the Park Service was involved with that at least by the 60s and the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are probably some of the projects around the state. And of course, today, currently, um, there's a lot of work going on at Cane Hill in Washington yes. County. Um, obviously, that's privately funded and not done through state funding. But so, you know, Historic Arkansas Museum was really kind of the, the precursor to a lot of the preservation projects that we see today. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, do, uh, this kind of this part, but, um, uh, do you know stuff about the carriage house? Because uh, I know that that's definitely she built that because she thought that that's what was appropriate. And there's like even a shelter underneath that's very much like I think Cold War bomb shelter. <laughs> um, the, the carriage house uh, it was one of those buildings that was <laughs> built as part of her vision of what this neighborhood would look like. The interesting thing is, is when you look back at the old Sanborn fire insurance maps, which date back um, in Little Rock to 1886, there was never a building on that location. Oh, at all? No. Oh. Uh, if I remember it, there was never even an outbuilding for, for one of the houses on that location. So it was, it was very much a new structure that was built in the 30s and 40s. It was very much something that fit the vision of you know these nice houses and must have had a carriage house, yeah. <laughs> um, even though they likely did not. Mm -hmm. um, when the houses were first built, a lot of them were single-family residences, but by the late 19th century and the early 20th century, they had a variety of uses. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were labeled as female boarding houses, mm -hmm. some of them were labeled as Negro tenements. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a lot that were used as restaurants at various points in their history, and so a carriage house just did not fit <laughs> with the reality of what the neighborhood was. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very much part of, of Miss Loughborough's vision for the area. <laughs> That's um, well, great. Um, is there anything in this that we should talk about? Um, I think that's kind of it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you for coming. And You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Great. Okay, cool. That was really good. Okay, great. <laughs> cool. Like, you know, sometimes whenever, yeah, like just under 14. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Or just under 15. Yeah, that's, that's a good one.